You know what really grinds my gears? When the media says so-and-so faces up to 11 billion years in prison. And while that's theoretically possible, it's never right. And here, Trump faces real jail time for what he's accused of. How much exactly? Well, luckily, Scalow knows exactly how much jail time Trump would get if he's convicted. Thanks, Devin. You know, it wasn't until this moment that I actually started suspecting that I died and went to hell. Doing a deep dive into the federal sentencing guidelines for Donald Trump's case? I mean, I think Dante mentioned that as happening somewhere on the lower levels. Federal sentencing. A rational, predictable, and fair process that would be impossible to thwart by a narcissistic man-child who runs a major political party as a cult of personality. Unless you've been living under a rock, you've heard that Donald Trump was indicted in the Southern District of Florida for 36 counts relating to the willful retention of classified documents, as well as a scheme to obstruct the investigation into that retention. We've done at least one video on this channel. But here's the Cliff's notes of what's alleged. When he left office on January 20th, 2021, Donald Trump caused a bunch of boxes filled with classified national defense information to be moved to his Mar-a-Lago club in Palm Beach, Florida. According to the indictment, Trump had the boxes stored in unsecured locations and even showed some of those materials to visitors, possibly including Kid Rock, not joking. Beginning in May 2021, the National Archives and Records Administration repeatedly demanded that Trump turn over certain records that he had kept after his presidency. Trump didn't comply. So ultimately, on March 30th, 2022, the FBI opened a criminal investigation into the unlawful retention of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. And on May 11th of 2022, a federal grand jury issued a subpoena to Trump requiring the production of all documents with classification markings. Trump caused some documents to be produced on June 3rd, 2022, along with a certification from one of his attorneys, Trump attorney number three, according to the indictment, that all documents had been produced. Well, as it turns out, that certification was false. The FBI got its hands on surveillance footage showing Trump's valet, Walt Nauta, as well as another employee moving boxes around Mar-a-Lago in advance of June 3rd to hide certain documents. So on August 8th, 2022, the FBI executed a search warrant on Mar-a-Lago and found the remaining documents. The indictment contains 37 separate charges, although only 36 relate to Trump. Counts one through 31 charge Trump with willfully retaining national defense information in violation of 18 U.S.C. 793E, which is the Espionage Act. Counts 1 through 21 relate to documents that were obtained during that August 8th search warrant, while counts 22 to 31 relate to documents that were produced by Trump's attorney on June 3rd. Counts 32 through 36 are basically a bunch of different ways of charging obstruction of justice for hiding the documents that were recovered on August 8th. So here's the question. What's Trump looking at? If you were to take this case to trial and be found guilty of all counts, counts 1 through 36, what kind of sentence would he receive? What's at stake here? Now, you'll remember in our George Santos video, I took a quick little dive into the federal sentencing guidelines. Now we're going to take it to 11. These go to 11. We are going to nerd out. And I'm not even going to apologize for it. This is going to be fun. But I'm also going to tell you this. This is the only time we're doing it. In any future video where we're going to talk about the federal sentencing guidelines, we're just going to put up a little thumbnail and link you back to this one. I'm just not doing this twice. In 1984, the United States Congress overwhelmingly passed the Sentencing Reform Act. The Sentencing Reform Act did a couple different things, including eliminating federal parole. But most importantly for our purposes, it established the United States Sentencing Commission. That commission was tasked with creating the sentencing guidelines. The basic policy behind the sentencing guidelines was to establish a fair and effective sentencing system. There were three fundamental goals in the new sentencing scheme. First, honesty in sentencing. Second, reasonable uniformity. And three, proportionality. Honesty in sentencing was easy to achieve with the elimination of federal parole. A person sentenced to prison serves that sentence, minus maybe 15% for good behavior. Reasonable uniformity and proportionality, however, are a little bit more difficult, and they're sometimes in tension with one another. The sentencing guidelines can't take into account every single detail and wrinkle in every single case. So in addition to creating a framework for treating similarly situated defendants similarly, the guidelines allowed for departures from the guidelines under certain circumstances. In other words, the guidelines maintained a limited amount of discretion for judges to give leniency or impose harsher sentences. At the time it was created, the idea was that the sentencing guidelines would be binding on federal judges. 
But the Supreme Court put a pin in that. On separation of powers grounds, the Supreme Court said that federal judges could be forced to consider the sentencing guidelines, and appellate courts could presume those sentences were reasonable, but judges could not be bound by them entirely. The sentencing guidelines rely on something called the sentencing table. The vertical axis tracks the seriousness of the offense. An offense level of 1 results in a much lower sentence than an offense level of 28. The horizontal axis tracks the criminal history of the defendant. The greater the criminal history, the greater the sentence. So a defendant with no criminal history who commits a crime with an offense level of 17 has a guidelines range of 24 to 30 months in prison. If only it were that simple. Each crime has a base offense level and then potentially a bunch of adjustments up or down from that base offense level. It gets even more complicated when the defendant is convicted of multiple crimes, and we will get there. In any given federal criminal case, there are three steps the district court judge has to follow to sentence the defendant. First, correctly calculate the applicable guidelines range. Any sentence within the guidelines range, so long as the guidelines were applied correctly, which is a big assumption and subject to much litigation, can be presumed to be reasonable. Second, consult the grounds for departure provided in the policy statements of the sentencing guidelines. And third, apply the factors contained in 18 U.S.C. section 3553A. So what are those factors? I mean, they're pretty generic. Look at the nature and circumstances of the crime and the characteristics of the defendant. Consider how the sentence will impose a just punishment, deter other criminal conduct, protect the public, and potentially reform the defendant. And look at how defendants with similar records in similar cases were sentenced to avoid unwarranted disparities between defendants. When appellate courts review a federal criminal sentence, they have their own little two-step dance to do. The first step is to ensure that the district court committed no significant procedural error, such as improperly calculating the guidelines range. The second step is to consider the substantive reasonableness of the sentence itself, taking into account the totality of the circumstances, including the extent of any variance from the guidelines range. The appellate court considers the substantive reasonableness of the sentence itself under an abuse of discretion standard, which is pretty deferential to the district court judge. Okay, with all that in mind, let's look at Trump's indictment. We're going to start with the willful retention counts, counts 1 through 31. What are the base offense levels of those counts? Well, the sentencing guidelines actually don't make this super easy, probably because while this crime does come up, it's not as common as, say, robbery. There are two sections of the guidelines that seem like they could apply, 2M3.2 and 2M3.3. I'm just going to call those sections 2 and 3, just to make things easy. Plenty of commentators have used section 2, probably because its title in the guidelines is Gathering National Defense Information, while section 3's title refers to transmitting and disclosing. Well, so it seems obvious, right? There's also probably some motivated reasoning, because section 2 has a higher base offense level. 35 for top secret information, and 30 otherwise. That's in contrast to section 3, where it's 29 for top secret information, and 24 otherwise. Sadly for those commentators, they're probably wrong. In United States v. Aquino, the Third Circuit hit this issue squarely on the nose and held that willful retention, exactly what Trump is accused of doing, gets the lesser guidelines range in section 3. Incidentally, the Second Circuit agreed with the Third Circuit the next year in United States v. Malky. And while neither of these decisions binds the Southern District of Florida, which is in the Eleventh Circuit, the Third Circuit's analysis in Aquino is pretty persuasive. So let's just work under that framework. Section 3 applies for the willful retention counts. Then for every count alleging the retention of top secret information, the base offense level is 29. And for each other count alleging something not top secret, the base offense level is 24. The next thing we do is look at some adjustments. There are three adjustments that seem like they could probably apply here. The first adjustment is for Trump's role as organizer or leader of the alleged criminal activity. There is no doubt that he was the leader, the decision maker, when it came to the retention of the classified documents. As such, he gets a two-point increase from the base offense level. Now, if the criminal activity involved five or more participants or was otherwise extensive, the court can add another two points to the base offense level. I'm not convinced that we have that here. I've seen some other commentators do it, but I'm not going to. Based on the indictment, we could have five participants, Walt Nauta, employee number two, and attorneys one through three. 
The problem is that a participant is defined as someone also criminally responsible for the offense. And it's not entirely clear just how criminally responsible employee two and attorneys one through three really are, nor is extensive defined. So I think it's safer just to give Trump a two point increase for a general leadership role. And believe me, it's not gonna make that much of a difference later on. The second adjustment is for abuse of a position of trust. Trump can get another two point increase if he abused a position of public or private trust in a manner that significantly facilitated the commission or concealment of the offense. This is a bit of a no brainer and it's frequently applied in these kinds of cases. After all, virtually all people charged with willfully retaining national defense information had a right to access that national defense information at some point. They had clearance and need to know, which arguably really only comes from a position of public trust. For former President Trump, it seems even more obvious. He had access to those documents by virtue of his role as president, which significantly facilitated the commission of the crimes alleged. This was not just extreme carelessness with classified material, which is still totally disqualifying. This is calculated, deliberate, premeditated misconduct, followed by a cover-up that included false statements and lies to Congress, the media, and the American people. The third and final adjustment is for obstruction of justice. That's another two-point increase to the base offense level. Now, you may think, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're talking about willful retention counts, not the obstruction of justice counts. But the sentencing guidelines often contain adjustments or cross-references like this. And a big part of it is in the philosophy of the sentencing guidelines. We'll see that clearly later on when we're talking about grouping, but suffice it to say, the obstruction of justice adjustment counts. So what are we left with? Well, for each of the counts alleging willful retention of top secret information, we have an adjusted defense level of 35. That's the base offense level of 29, plus two for the leadership role, plus two for the abuse of public trust, and plus two for obstruction. For each count alleging willful retention of other than top secret information, we have an adjusted offense level of 30, that's a base offense level of 24, plus two for the leadership role, plus two for the abuse of public trust, and plus two for obstruction. If we assume that Trump has no criminal history at the time of sentencing, an adjusted offense level of 35 carries a presumptive 168 to 210 months in prison, or about 14 to 17 and a half years. Oh, but we are not done yet. What about the rest of the charges in the indictment? Even with different names and charges, counts 32 through 36 are all going to be analyzed under the same section of the guidelines, 2X3.1. I am not going to walk us through the details on these, but I'll just say that I think it's likely that for counts 32 through 36, each will have an adjusted offense level of 27. That's a base offense level of 23, plus two for the leadership role, and plus two for the abuse of public trust. You don't get the adjustment for obstruction of justice because that's the crime. With no criminal history, each of counts 32 through 36 has a guidelines range of 70 to 87 months, or about six to seven years in prison. If we assume that Trump has no criminal history at the time of sentencing, an adjusted offense level of 35 carries a presumptive 168 to 210 months in prison, or about 14 to 17 and a half years. For the adjusted offense level of 30, we have 97 to 121 months, so up to about 10 years. Oh, but we are not done yet. Okay, wow. So we're talking 31 counts of willful retention where we're looking at eight to 10 or 14 to 17 and a half years in prison and another five counts where he could get six to seven years. That means Trump's gonna get like 500 years in prison, right? No, just, just no. Now we have to do a little something the guidelines calls grouping. The fundamental philosophical idea behind grouping is this. A defendant who injures 10 people during a fight may warrant more punishment than if he injures one, but his conduct does not necessarily warrant 10 times the punishment. Grouping is also meant as a check on prosecutors. A prosecutor may be able to charge a defendant under 10 different statutes for a single criminal act, but that doesn't mean that the defendant should get 10 times the sentence. There are four ways of grouping closely related counts, but only three are potentially relevant to Trump's case. A, when counts involve the same victim and the same act or transaction. B, when counts involve the same victim and two or more acts or transactions connected by a common criminal objective 
or constituting part of a common scheme or plan. Or C, when one of the counts embodies conduct that is treated as a specific offense characteristic in or other adjustment to the guideline applicable to another of the counts. So right off the bat, we're going to make three kind of provisional groups. Counts 1 through 21 get grouped together because they basically involve the same conduct over the same date range, January 20th of 2021 through August 8th of 2022. You just have separate counts based on separate documents. Counts 22 through 31 get grouped together for the same reason, although the date range is different, January 20th of 2021 through June 3rd of 2022. So let's think back. Why do we have the different date ranges? It's because the documents in counts 22 through 31 were turned over to the FBI on June 3rd, 2022, along with that false certification signed by Trump Attorney 3. It was only later that the FBI obtained surveillance video showing the movement of boxes in Mar-a-Lago, which resulted in the August 8th search warrant. And it was through that search warrant that the FBI found the documents for counts 1 through 21. So should all those willful retention counts be grouped together? After all, there's a single victim, the federal government, and wasn't the willful retention of the national defense information connected by a common criminal objective, or was there a common scheme or plan? I get that argument. I do. But the idea behind that kind of grouping is that there's a single composite harm from the criminal scheme. So think about a different example. If a defendant is convicted of three counts of mail fraud for mailings that happened on three separate days, those three counts can be grouped together to represent the composite harm of the overall mail fraud scheme. But in Trump's case, the federal government might be able to point to a separate and distinct harm between counts 1 through 21 on one hand and counts 22 through 31 on the other. After all, the FBI had to go and execute a search warrant for the former president's club, a pretty remarkable event in our nation's history. Moreover, the entire obstruction of justice scheme really related to those documents, the ones that were ultimately obtained by the search warrant, not the ones turned over on June 3rd. In fact, arguably, the documents turned over on June 3rd are part and parcel of that obstruction of justice scheme, since they were intended to convince the federal government that all the documents had been turned over. So for this video, we're going to keep counts 1 through 21 and counts 22 through 31 as separate groups. But spoiler alert, it doesn't make a huge difference in the end. We are, however, going to group counts 1 through 21 with counts 32 through 36, the obstruction of justice counts. Why? Well, for one, because we've already used the obstruction of justice adjustment to the base offense levels for those counts. We added two points to counts 1 through 21 for the obstruction of justice. And this kind of grouping is designed to avoid double counting. Again, it's a sort of check on charging decisions by prosecutors and overly aggressive judges. So in the end, we're left with two groups. Counts 1 through 21 and 32 through 36 constitute the first group. Counts 22 through 31 constitute the second group. All right, we are almost at the end of this interminable process. We're going to take the most serious adjusted defense level from the first group, and a bunch of them share it. It's 35 for willful retention of top secret information. And all that that second group does is allow us to add two points to the 35 for a grand total combined defense level of 37. I'll say that again. The combined defense level of 37 covers the entire indictment, all of the charges. So with no criminal history for the entire indictment, Trump gets a final guidelines range of 210 to 262 months in prison, or about 17 and a half to 22 years. <sighs> okay, that was fun, wasn't it? I mean, I was told there'd be no math, but here we are. It was my understanding that there would be no math. So that's it, right? If Donald J. Trump were convicted of all charges in the indictment after trial, he'd go to prison for 17 and a half to 22 years in prison. Eh, no. Nope, that would be too easy. We're lawyers, and if it were easy, you wouldn't need us, and we need job security. So first of all, any violation of 18 U.S.C. 793E, the willful retention statute from the Espionage Act, has a maximum punishment of 10 years in prison. So if a judge thinks that the total guidelines range is appropriate, 17 and a half to 22 years, the judge is going to have to run some counts consecutively to get there. And they have that authority. The judge has two more things to consider. First, departures. 
Remember, the sentencing guidelines themselves recognize that a departure from the guidelines range might be appropriate under certain circumstances. A departure can go upward to more prison time or downward to less, including to probation. The guidelines include considerations unique to the defendant, like their age, education and vocational skills, employment record, family ties and responsibilities, and more. They also include considerations about the crimes themselves, such as whether the victim suffered significant physical injury, or whether there was a significant disruption in governmental function, or even the victim's conduct, and again, so much more. Second, and perhaps more importantly, remember that the guidelines themselves are just advisory. At the end of this entire process, the judge considers the factors outlined in 18 U.S.C. 3553A, which again, basically tells the judge to look at the totality of the circumstances and to avoid any sort of unwarranted sentencing disparities between defendants with similar records who committed similar crimes. So what's a judge to do? This indictment presents circumstances that really have never been seen before. While plenty of people have gone to prison for long periods of time for willful retention of national defense information, none of those people are a former president, not to mention one who is actively campaigning for the presidency. Now, whether that's something that the sentencing judge should even take into consideration or what weight they should give it is arguable. No matter what, though, the sentencing judge would have to balance some pretty unique considerations in obtaining a just outcome. Those unique considerations might blow up any attempt to compare Trump's sentence with others who committed similar conduct. And so in the end, it's going to be up to the judge. As the saying goes, a good lawyer knows the law, but a great lawyer knows the judge. You could have a district court judge, say, uh, Rylene Shannon, who could laugh at the guidelines range and depart to probation. But you could also have a judge who has a very different opinion. And the nice thing about the sentencing guidelines is it could give that kind of a judge cover. We don't like to consider judges as political animals, but they are to a certain extent. And if a judge who's so inclined is able to point to the sentencing guidelines and say, look, that's what it tells me to do, it gives them a little bit of cover in imposing what some people might consider a harsh sentence. Now, the government, like the defendant, can appeal a sentence. But as long as the judge followed all the procedures and articulated a reasonable basis for perhaps a departure to probation, an appellate court might not find that it was an abuse of discretion. All that's to say that nothing is written in stone here. All we know is that a very long prison term, 17 and a half to 22 years, would probably be reasonable and appropriate under the guidelines. But we have no idea how a judge in this case might actually sentence Donald Trump. Assuming that Donald Trump is found guilty after a trial on all of these charges, whoever the sentencing judge is, is going to have a very hard decision to make. Of course, when and if Judge Cannon issues that order, she's gonna have to write it down clearly and concisely, which she can do with today's sponsor, Grammarly. And now, Grammarly Go accelerates your writing process by generating and modifying text instantly on demand. You'll be writing responsive, thoughtful emails and posts faster than ever. It's a huge productivity boost. And unlike other AI tools, Grammarly Go tailors its output to your unique context. It picks up on key details and incorporates them into what you're writing. I can set my voice to be casual and empathetic, for example, if I'm writing to friends, or I can send it to be more direct if I'm writing to enemies like opposing counsel. And of course, this is Grammarly, so it fixes poor writing in the first place. Not that, you know, I would ever do that. And it can give prompts to make something shorter, sharper, and more exciting. Now, as a content creator, I have to do a lot of script writing, and with Grammarly Go's features, I can rewrite my scripts to be more engaging instantly. And as a lawyer, I have to do a lot of writing and translating legal jargon into something more readable. And Grammarly Go's rewrite feature helps me communicate more clearly the way that I want. I just have to make sure that I do all all of the legal research myself. But you can even use it for ideation to get ideas about what you want to write about in the first place. You'll be amazed at what you can do with Grammarly Go. So if you want to give it a try, you can get 20% off by going to the link that's on screen right now or down in the description. Again, to be more productive than ever and get 20% off of Grammarly Go, just click on the link below. And after that, click on this link over here for more Legal Eagle, or I'll see you in court.